Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for a uh, little question and answer segment. Jacob, there seems to be a growing uh, trend in conspiracy theory attention, especially within the Christian community. There's many well-meaning individuals, people that I know personally, who've been taken in with um, unnecessary talk of things like the Illuminati, um, you know, King James onlyism, flat Earth, a whole host of things, and they only seem to be growing. Um, and uh, some of these things can be quite curious and interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on all of this? In a teaching we did, a recorded teaching, it was not filmed, called the or entitled the Four Sons of Isaiah, primarily from the Book of Isaiah, chapters seven, eight, and nine. We looked at prophecies concerning both the first and second coming of Jesus found in those chapters 7, 8, and 9 of Isaiah. Things about his first coming and things about his second coming. One of the things we pointed out in that teaching was that there will be an increase in certain kinds of activities before the Lord returns. We look at Isaiah chapter 8. Again, as always, bearing in mind, we have no divisions in the original canon between the chapters. And we see there'll be this increase in occult activity. Uh, people are warned in, in verse 10, when they say to you, consult the mediums and spiritists and whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they not? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Again, there'll be an increase in occult activity. That will include necromancy, people consulting the dead on behalf of the living, mediums, spiritists coming among God's people. Now, this is certainly true in Talmudic Judaism, specifically Hasidic Judaism. Hasidic Jews practice Kabbalah. Their guidebook is the Zohar. They reinterpret the Hebrew scriptures in light of the Babylonian mysticism, a Jewishized version of it, called the Zohar, and practice Kabbalah, something that they claim was received, but it's pure Gnosticism. We've spoken about this many times. Hasidic Judaism is increasing among Jews and among religious Jews. The Lubavitch movement, also known as Chabad, is, is very fast growing. And you see Jews praying at the grave of their dead rabbi, uh, Menachem Schneerson, who they believed was the Messiah. That's just one example. We see Roman Catholics doing the same thing. The prophecies ascribed to things like Fatima and Lords with Mary and, and knock Ireland and things like this and Magigori. Well, Mary died. Now she's alive in Christ, but her corpse is not risen. The Roman Catholic doctrine of the Assumption of Mary is purely bogus. It's not found anywhere in Scripture. They're consulting the dead on behalf of the living. We had people in evangelical circles attempting to do the same thing. One, of course, was the late Earl Park who believed there could be a kind of Christian seance. Uh, because the occult counterfeits the truth, there must be a true way to speak to, to people who have entered eternity. These things are becoming more prevalent, and more believers are being caught up in it. The week before last, we had the giving up of the ghost of a false prophet, who was very much a man with a familiar spirit. He was uh, the spirit medium. Uh, Paul Kane of the Kansas City False Prophets, an alcoholic and a homosexual, but the man had a familiar spirit of some description, promoted by Mike Bickle and the late John Wimber. People were looking to these essentially mediums and clairvoyants, but trying to call it Christianity. This kind of thing increases, but something else increases that predisposes people to it when we read Isaiah chapter 8. In verse 12, 
you shall not say it is a conspiracy in regard to all this people call a conspiracy. You are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. The focus we need to have is what the Lord has said to us in and through his word, the prophecies of the book of Revelation, of Daniel, of Ezekiel, of Zechariah, of what is coming upon the earth in the last days, of the advent of Antichrist. These are the things we need to concern ourselves with what is in Scripture. The Lord our God, we should fear, he is our dread. Now, of course, he will save the faithful church from his wrath, but his wrath is coming. That is what we need to be aware of. Instead, people become obsessed with conspiracies. In the secular world, we have conspiracy theorists. There have actually been academic papers written from a clinical scholarly perspective by secular psychiatrists of people who have suffered even schizophrenic symptoms based on conspiracy theory type paranoia, or they become delusional. They actually believe these things manifesting itself in clinical psychosis. Papers have been written, published in the American Journal of Psychiatric Medicine and things of this nature. The medical profession recognizes psychosis that can be induced by people who are consumed by conspiracy theories who often seem to be certain personality types or people with a medical history of certain types of mental disorders. Part of the problem with conspiracy theories is there's always a grain of truth in it. Now here I'm just speaking on a secular level. There is always a grain of truth in it. But from that, people conjecture, they speculate, they extrapolate scenarios. Some of them taking it to the point that they believe it as fact. And if you don't believe it, in extreme cases, they'll think that makes you either naive, deceived, blasé, or even potentially part of the conspiracy yourself. It's quite frightening. You live in New Mexico, the American Southwest. In Nevada, New Mexico, there are places such as Area 51, where stealth technology for aircraft is developed and tested by the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, the Pentagon. And if you get close enough to these places, you're going to find barbed wire, heat-seeking sensor devices, all kinds of laser monitoring and photographic monitoring, and warning signs that the use of force is permitted in the apprehension of trespassers. Keep out. People drive by and they see those signs. U.S. government property, keep out. Trespassers will be prosecuted. The use of force is allowed by federal statute, etc. It says this. And with the laser detectors, audio detectors, all kinds of monitoring cameras, electrified razor wire, what's going on in there? They're trying to hide something from us. Well, there's a grain of truth in it. The government does not want a lot of that information of what takes place in those R&D projects in the public domain for obvious reasons. There is that aircraft hangar with the vault underneath it in Ohio near Dayton where Senator Barry Goldwater, himself a pilot, was denied permission to enter by the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff, Curtis Lee May, a fellow conservative. Why? There are true things. The declassified blue report by the Carter administration was not a full release of all government research into 
extraterrestrial phenomena, but it did release a considerable amount of the research carried on by the Air Force, by NASA, and by the Central Intelligence Agency, and by certain other foreign governments, particularly the British, into extraterrestrial phenomena. There are things that cannot be conventionally explained. That is true. It is interesting, in the Blue Report, one of the things that was investigated were parapsychics, people who could, they believe, conjure the appearance of unidentified flying objects, hence a relationship between the occult and the paranormal, the occult and UFO research. Some people have elevated this to the status of a religion. People are influenced by movies like Star Wars and E.T. and television programs, uh, such as with Mr. Spock and so forth. These things have influenced the public psyche, going back to the time of Superman, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars by David Bowie. They've influenced popular culture, predisposing people to it. Now, there's always a grain of truth in these things, a grain, but things become extrapolated. Now, for the record, some years ago on a teaching we did just as in the days of Noah, I spoke of the Nephilim. I'm quite convinced, as have a number of people been, the late author John Weldon, a friend of mine among them, also the Christian journalist uh, Bill Elnor. He had a PhD in journalism. He taught journalism, but he researched uh, occult relationships to UFO activity. That the Antichrist and false prophet are likely to use extraterrestrial phenomena as part of their deception. I've always believed that. <coughs> I've been convinced of that since the 1970s. I've believed that, again, Superman and Buck Rogers and E.T. and Star Trek and these things have influenced the popular culture, predisposing people to it through the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. There's a degree of truth in it. But people become obsessed with it and they extrapolate all kinds of scenarios they treat as fact about Area 51 or about a lot of other things. That makes it complicated. Let's take the most famous conspiracy, perhaps in human history, certainly in modern history. Everybody knows Lee Harvey Oswald was in Russia and defected to Russia and was allowed to come back. And his wife was a Russian. Everybody knows that. That he was a left-wing political activist in support of Castro. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that Jack Ruby, who killed him, was involved with organized crime. There was a connection between Sam Giacanti in Chicago and uh, Marcelo in, in, in New Orleans. There were at least two major crime families who had the impetus to kill JFK. Why did the mafia want to silence Oswald? Everybody knows the CIA was cooperating with the mafia against Fidel Castro. Everybody knows that about Cuba. Everybody knows the FBI was aware of Oswald, and J. Edgar Hoover would have been greatly embarrassed publicly had it been known that the FBI had a tag on him just before he killed the president and the FBI failed to prevent it. There were people who had a motive to keep it secret. Everybody knows that it politically advantaged Lyndon Baines Johnson to the White House, to the presidency. He probably could have not been elected. Otherwise, he never would have made it to the Oval Office. He was a corrupt president. Everybody knows these things are true. There are elements of truth in all these things. But if you were to go online, there are literally hundreds hundreds of conspiracy theories about the assassination of JFK and who did it 
And was the mafia involved with the CIA? And did Lyndon Johnson know it? And, you know, to what degree was the FBI party to it? Or was it Castro and the communists? Did they try to cover it up with the Warren Report to prevent the war with Russia over it? Things like this. It goes on and on and on. Now, there are elements of truth in these things. That always becomes the problem. The first problem with conspiracy theories is they have elements of truth. But there's a difference between elements of truth and a comprehensive presentation, a definitive compendium of the truth. This is what happened. Now, that's in the secular world. That's among unsaved people. That's everything from Area 51 to the Kennedy assassination and other things. Let's look at the church. What happens when there are believers, saved Christians, or at least people who profess to be born-again believers, evangelical Christians, even churches, who become caught up in conspiracy theories and confuse conspiracy theories with discernment ministry and end-time prophecy? One of the kingpins in this was somebody, I believe, called John Todd back in the 70s. He claimed to be a descendant of the Puritans, and he had this whole hoodwinked version of what transpired in Salem, Massachusetts. You had other people concerned about the Eye of Horus and the pyramid on the U.S. dollar and New World Order in Latin on the dollar. It goes back to Alexander Hamilton and George Washington being Freemasons, and it's always been a conspiracy. When the Illuminist ideas of of Felix Weishaupt permeated Freemasonry, and there's a conspiracy of these secret Satanists in London and New York and Washington to bring Satan to power. Again, no saved Christian should be involved in Freemasonry. That is clear. Read the testimonies of 33rd and 32nd degree Masons. There's not many, but there's enough who've gotten saved. They will tell you it is theosophically Luciferian. You are taking a blood oath. They are calling God Gautu, the great architect of the universe. When people reach the, uh, the holy ark of the third degree, the royal ark of the third degree, whatever they call it, and in Scotland it's the ancient right No Christian should be involved with this. It's permeated with the occult and superstition and blood oaths. It's clear no Christian should be involved with it. But when you take it further and say that there's a definite plan by the people in control of the Federal Reserve and the World Bank and the the IMF to bring the Antichrist to power, now you're going beyond speculation. What happens when people do this is they discredit any valid content in what they're trying to make people aware of. When they construct these scenarios, they discredit any elements of truth that are contained in their statements. Well, let's look at this. You are not to call a conspiracy, all those people call a conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. It's the Lord your God whom you should regard as holy. What these conspiracy theorists do and what conspiracy theories do is draw people's attention away from the word of God, away from what the scriptures say about the rise of the Antichrist and about the designs of Satan in the last days eschatologically and about prophecies of what's going to happen with the church and with Israel and the nations. It draws people away from studying Daniel and Revelation and Zechariah and Ezekiel in exegetical context, having them obsessed with theories about the Illuminati or other such things. 
Now, it's fine to be aware of the history of Illuminism and Freemasonry, and for sure no Christian should be involved with it. Any saved Christian who's a Mason should leave. They should burn those occult books and aprons and have nothing to do with the Masonic Lodge. It should be renounced. That's clear, as with any other occult activity. But notice here, when Isaiah talks about the occult in verse 19, he prefaces it with conspiracies in verse 12. <laughs> There's a relationship between the occult and conspiracy theories. No, the Lord is holy. Focus on him. Focus on the coming of Christ, Isaiah says. Now, this applies, of course, both to his first and second coming, but we're talking about his second coming. All you have is conspiracy theorists in the church. They are not conspicuously different in substance than the conspiracy theorists of the secular world who are obsessed with the Kennedy assassination or Area 51. Only they're calling it spiritual discernment and end time prophecy. And they become consumed, even obsessed with it, at the expense of ignoring what the word of God tells them to concentrate on, which is the word of the Lord. Another problem with conspiracy theories getting into the church masquerading as prophecy and discernment is this. Satan is clever. He's a clever strategist. It becomes the boy that cried wolf syndrome. People predict this and predict that and say this and say that. And when these things don't materialize, when something of authentic prophetic significance happens, people will think it's just those crazy people again, just those born again nutters again. People will think that. Satan is out to discredit the true church and its message. He does this in many ways. He does it with the word faith money preachers. He does it with hype artistry, but he certainly does it with conspiracy theorists. When something really happens that's prophetically important, and there are things happening now in Europe with Brexit, in, in the Middle East with Syria, that are prophetically important with Iran, that are prophetically significant. Instead of watching that, people become concerned with things the scripture does not speak to, except warning us not to be caught up in it as a conspiracy theory. When something happens and the church tries to blow, blow the whistle, sound the alarm, people won't listen. They'll have heard so much nonsense, and they hear a lot of nonsense. This is the devil. It's his strategy. Sincere Christians are being manipulated because they're not looking to the word of God and being led by his spirit according to his word. That is what is happening. Christians should not be lured into this, but many times new believers are. They're told that this kind of thing is the study of prophecy and discernment. It is not what the scriptures mean by end time prophecy and discernment. Is there an element of truth in these things? Yes, there's an element of truth. Like anything else Satan does, patas exus, and it says in Peter, the truth is placed next to the error as camouflage. There's elements of truth in it. It's good to be aware of what people say, but it's not our focus. We are not to fear what they fear. We are not to call it a conspiracy because it takes our eyes off the real conspiracy. The real conspiracy is much more sophisticated than what they're telling you. The real conspiracy is Satan trying to bring the Antichrist to power. 
not by people who are doing it cognizantly, but by people who are spiritually seduced and are not cognizant of what they're doing. When the Babylonian captivity happened, the false prophets and the corrupt Levitical priesthood who misled the nation in the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they were not intentionally trying to bring the people to Babylon, but they were satanically manipulated into doing it. It's the same now. Avoid conspiracy theorists. Avoid conspiracy theories. Yes, there are elements of truth in these things, and it's fine to be aware of those. But that's all. Do what the Word of God tells us. He specifically addresses this issue of conspiracy theories prior to the coming of the Lord. These things happened in his first coming. There were all kinds of theories. Many false messiahs preceded the first coming of Jesus. Many. One of them, Judah of Galilee, is named in the book of Acts, but there were others. Simon Magnus was another figure. When you read Eusebius, Simon Magnus from the book of Acts chapter 8, he was a humongous figure internationally. Uh, this kind of activity accompanied the first coming of Jesus, and it's accompanying his second coming as well. We need to focus on the word. Do not call a conspiracy all those people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Fear the Lord. It is the Lord who is holy. We need to concentrate on him and what his word tells us about the last days and the coming of Jesus. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you for listening.